So today's talk is um, Huma House is presenting Christian Branscombe, who founded um, this art collective at Lancaster State Prison while incarcerated. Um, and I mean, Susan, Peter, and Allison, actually, you guys have all, you know, you, you have a background on the show. Um, but the Bail Project um, has given us their space here. Um, and they donated their office space and we've, we've converted into a gallery and Huma House is a contemporary arts initiative that focuses on artists who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated and shows their work. Um, and uh, I, just a little background on Christian, how we met, um, this was just at the way beginning of my journey in finding artists. Um, I had no, I didn't have any network, I didn't know anyone um, in that space and Christian was one of the first people I talked to um, and he generously gave a lot of his time and connected me to artists who are still incarcerated and who had, who had gone out. Um, and I just, I was so grateful to all the knowledge that he had and his willingness to just open up his contact book and um, connect me. Um, so Christian, uh, let me pin this. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's, it's definitely a pleasure to, to be here. And I'm always grateful that uh, people like yourself are willing to, to look for those voices in there. And, and I think it's really important for people like yourself to reach in because the way the prisons are designed is you really can't reach out and have a voice while you're inside. So without people like yourself and uh, people that are mindful that people in there need to be found, it's, uh, you know, they don't end up having a voice. So I think it's very generous of you to take the time to exhibit these guys art and give them a voice. And in there, it's, it's very important to have one. Yeah, and it's, it's been really fun so far. Um, just, I, I've learned so much. And um, one of the things that I learned is what we're gonna be kind of talking about today is about the collective that you started um, at, while you are at Lancaster. Um, and I, there's a couple pictures with sli uh, some slides with pictures just to give you a sense of um, the environment. Um, so Christian, can you talk a little bit about the history and, and why you decided to start? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So we were, we were on a, well, at the time was called an honor yard and it was mostly designed and developed by life without the possibility of parole prisoners. So people that were never gonna have the opportunity to go home or to be reconnected with the community. And they were in a program that Arts and Corrections, which is a state ran uh, and state funded program that was designed for rehabilitation is where we originally you know, became connected. So around 2005, 2006, <clears throat> started going into this art room and it was kind of an each one teach one type of environment, but the funding for the supplies came from the state. And we started doing these programs like Toys for Tots and you know, Battered Women's Shelter in the local area, Boys and Girls Club. And we, we became very connected to this idea that we could give back, that something we were doing was contributing to other people. And it really felt good to have that opportunity. So in 2009, they took out Arts and Corrections in, in CDCR and uh, the California Correction System because they didn't see it as rehabilitative or that it wasn't rehabilitative enough to be invested in the way that it was. They wanted to use the money for other things. So they just took out the hobby program. They took out all of the, all of the stops. There was no access all, to- All those funding was cut. Yes, it was right. completely cut. And the resources for us to do any type of in-cell hobby as well. So at that point, uh, some of the guys on the yard were like, this is really uh, a, a, a negative thing for us because it feels good for us to be able to get back. The community doesn't get to have that feedback. And so, we, we started developing uh, a way to have in-cell hobby on the yard and we started working with the administration trying to figure out what it, how, where could we fund this ourselves so that we could still have these, these abilities and these privileges to give back to the community. And at some point, the, one of the rooms in education came open, open which was really rare opportunity inside. Right. And we told them that we were willing to buy all of our own supplies and, and to run all of our own functions. All they had to do was give us the space and, and be that connection to the community for us. And when they did that, uh, you know, we just, we just went in there full bore. And it was a, a really uh, life-changing program for us. And it evolved over time into a really influential program that 
not only impacted because initially it was for wounded warriors and people that came back from war that were forgotten. Uh, it ended right. up evolving into many other programs and opportunities to give back. And one thing that that struck me when you were talking about it is you were saying how this was a multiracial art collective. And when people stepped in, like racial boundaries didn't matter and gang boundaries didn't matter. And that was so, can you explain why that was so, so profound to do that um, in, in prison and where you were? Yes, absolutely. Because prison is pretty much designed you know, as a racial structure. I mean, on, on the prisoner side of the fence, they, you know, they all the lines are divided racially. And even through the officers, you know, they, they approach it through a racial structure because that's the way prison is in California. So when we have this room and we're investing, you know, thousands of our own dollars and our art supplies, and, and we were a collective of people that basically to be in that room, you had to be invited in because you had to be trusted to, to not steal, to not you know, put people in a compromising position by hiding contraband in the room, you know, that you had to respect this space and value your give back to the community in a way that that was something that we could all trust in because we all had monetary interests and and proprietary interests in giving back in this program that we built. So in that space, we just we ourselves decided that there was no gang activity, that we were not going to have any type of drug use or drug interactions in there, we weren't going to hide contraband in the room, that, that there was no racial distinctions, that we were all equals in this space. And it really created a, a much different narrative for us inside of prison because those spaces didn't exist anywhere else that we were aware of. Right, right. Um, let me just go through a couple more slides and then I'll just, and then I'm going to pin you. Here's you teaching, instructing at Lancaster. And these are photos all taken by Peter Mertz, who's with us today. Hey, Peter. <laughs> um, this is actually at a different, uh, different prison. Um, but what Christian pointed out is that they had a dedicated art room, which is so important and which is so uh, fantastic that they were able to preserve that because, um, because then you, know, you can put the paintings away and you cre it creates a more streamlined studio practice um, and you have, a, you have a space to store your artwork and come back to. Um, but even, even though these guys didn't have that, they, you know, they're still having a great time. And, um, See, here, like, it, like a lot of times like this right here is a class. So you would come in, you use whatever supplies are present and then you go away. You might take some of the art with you or it might go out to the street. Mm -hmm. um, the difference between the art room was is that we were there from eight o'clock till 3.30 every single day. And nobody else could be in that space, which is unheard of inside of prison. So we actually had our own room, our own space, and we could run all of our own functions in there. We could have people come in from the free world to have classes. We could, we could do our own classes teaching other people. There was nothing that prohibited us from, from really developing something that was available to us, you know, every single day. And how did you get, um, I'm going to make, uh, stop share um how did how were you able to to negotiate that with um with the staff was that a difficult thing to do or is it we we were very fortunate in that we had been at that prison for a very long time when i went to that prison i was 23 years old uh by the time we were developing this prison I mean, this program, I was in my 30s, mid 30s. And by the end of my term there, I'd been there 21 years. So that's really unheard of in itself to be at one location for that amount of time. Mm -hmm. And because the staff knew who we were and, and where we had come from and what we were doing, they trusted in us, which is a very rare thing for the administration to look at people that they've watched evolve as people and go, you know, you've went from somebody that was probably not the most positive person to somebody that wants to give and doesn't get in trouble and, and really wants to, to have a different approach to life. So in a way they, they believed in us. Yeah. And um, you were saying how everything made in that art room was donated um, to the community. So yeah. um, that was the purpose of, of, of that. And how, how did you guys come up with that model and why was it so important for you to connect with um, to connect with people that way instead of, for example, you know, taking those artworks and sending them home to the family and selling them in a, in a different in a different capacity. Well, it, see, usually when you do an event like this inside, you get like 15 or 20 percent for materials out of the cut that goes out to the community. That's a standard rate. 
okay. for the way that they run programs. And we as a collective, there was about, you know, at the beginning, there was nine guys in the program. And then towards the end, it was almost 20. Uh, over a decade, it kind of evolved into that many people that were really of that mind to give back. We, we decided it was more it was more in the spirit of what we were doing to just pay for our own supplies and give it completely and, and, and not diminish the idea of what we were doing with that 15%. So, you know, getting a couple hundred bucks versus just having no, you know, concern about the money and just letting people have that was something that we valued because that's what it was about. It was about giving back. And towards the end of the program, it really became about developing a voice. And what did that voice mean to the people inside? And what did that mean to the community as we extended it out? And so the art went from representational art in the beginning, which was more of a learning practice. And as we evolved as artists, because we'd been in there so long, eventually it came to that point to says, what am I doing with my art? And what am I trying to say? And that was a really profound moment to see that narrative evolve inside of the art room. Yeah, yeah, I think that when you talk about it, it sounds kind of like a very pivotal step that was different than than other programs or just the way you've been taught because you're not, um, you know, you said to me, the one thing that people don't ask incarcerated people is what they think. And what you were encouraging people as a teacher, you know, as a mentor in that room, is you were telling them, you were asking them, paint from your perspective, you know, don't paint, don't reproduce a work of a, an old master like paint what you're feeling like your environment and um a lot of the guys were surprised to hear that you know that people wanted to see that or that that anyone cared oh it, that was a huge revelation for the guys and really for the few of us that were really stepping out into that space in the beginning they thought we were nuts they were like oh yeah nobody's gonna by that, nobody wants that because we were a very isolated community and yeah. basically most of the people that supported it were officers. So they want football jerseys and whatever, you know, like really, you know, mm -hmm. things that aren't asking us what we feel or think. Um, and as we went into those spaces, you know, we had to really go like every person that you're painting, what did they do that made them noteworthy? They shared their experience. They gave their take on the life that they were experiencing, which meant that they had to express their direct experience. And the last thing somebody wants to do in prison is be in prison. So most people that are in prison look outside the walls. They want to paint other people, beautiful spaces. They, that's their escape. It's a coping right. mechanism. So for them to really take that leap and go, you know, instead of avoiding prison, I'm going to articulate my experience within it. Was, a, was something that was completely contrary to their thinking and what they'd used art for before that. Right, and, and getting them, getting the artist to take that leap, was there, was there an amount of like psychological coaching to, to get people to, to reveal that vulnerable place within themselves? Because I imagine it's, it, it's gonna be kind of hard for someone to reveal you know the fear that they're feeling inside their their cell when they're used to using art as an outlet and, and not to not to take that mask off as Kenneth Webb you know uses uh, that motif a lot was it was it hard to get people to that place well you know I think that just like with any human being if there's a, a venue where they feel that they will actually be heard or they will be listened to at the very least mm -hmm. uh, they're they're eager to share their experience, I think what deepened their own experience through the art was the idea that they didn't ask themselves that question. They didn't go, what do I feel today? Or how do I feel about this idea? And how can I share it with someone else? As soon as you have that, that impetus behind it, like I need to make this relatable to another human being, you're actually creating a connection. Just that idea is interconnected. So as where before you might be thinking, this person doesn't care what I think. But now if you're preparing something for an art exhibit, you're saying, I am going to share this with another human being and they're going to receive it. Right. Whether they like it, dislike it or not, you're now communicating and interconnected with that audience. Right, and, and cultivating, I mean, part of that communication is, is, is finding your own voice, right? And sure. if, you're, if you see art as a conduit to the outside world, then you wanna, you know, you wanna say something and you, you don't want to paint, let's say, a reproduction of, of a painting someone else does of someone else's voice. You want to use that channel and, and say something that matters. 
Well, right. and and you'll and a lot of the guys that were in our group were very progressive. So we were all in the the group therapies. We're going through, you know, some of them are in NA, NA, A, other like we all of us were very into self help and exploring where we were at as people and finding an answer to that question of who am I and and what can I give? What do I have to give? In, in this in this environment or what is redemptive a lot of it for us was a redemptive quality in the sense that we had uh, harmed people and we wanted to give back in a way that you know mitigated that harm that we had caused and and hopefully change this really horrible experience into something that would at least had some value to it so a lot of times that's where the narrative would deepen I would say, okay, you're you're sharing a story like what do you what do you really care about and I would say well the other day you were talking about your kid going to school for the first time and that they had maybe more of an education than you did or you know you're so proud of the fact that that they still love you and connect with you how would you say that in a piece of art and then really like pushing them about something that they care about and want to express and is meaningful to them and then seeing the response of it commits them to that that artistic process and it, it deepens their experience right um, I thought so. I thought we could actually look at some of the artworks um, in the show, and then the ones um, by Kenneth, who is now um, the chairman of the nonprofit that you started. Um, so let me go back to here. Um, are Are you able to see my screen, or did I not, did I not share? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I can see it. Okay. Um, so. Can you talk about this piece um, from your perspective, like what actually what it means to you, like unrelated to to what you taught, and then and then talk about the specific, maybe like the um, like the stylistic elements of it that you encouraged Kenneth to explore. So so Kenneth is is now running the art room, and he was my direct student when I was there, and he also helped develop a, uh, an amends project that we had called Bare Bones that was about direct amends to our, to our survivors of our crimes. And this piece really is about, we did all of these things, we grew together, we evolved together, and inside it's really rare to have those types of connections with someone else. Not only does the environment not connect that way, but the fact that we weren't the same race was very contradictory to our environment and how our lives intersected and how closely we bonded was through that, what we call sitting in the fire, you know, sitting in that place of, of being uncomfortable or feeling like we're going to not exist anymore, but then finding that acceptance amongst each other. And we really had a very deep bond as we evolved as people because we were vulnerable and we shared our shame and we overcame that shame together as, as men. And so that was reflected into his art. And this particular piece actually was developed after I left. And this mm -hmm. is a portrait of himself being stuck inside of prison. And, and as all of the major players in his life that were influential or had, were the backbone of his connection to his stability was leaving. And he's stuck in a place where all of the masks are the only thing that matter. So the person that he's living with has a mask on. The person next door to him has a mask on. You know, it, he's stuck in a place where he's taken off his mask and now he can't look anybody in the face. And the key to freedom is way below where he can reach. It's outside of his reach. Mm -hmm. And so it really represents this idea of feeling abandoned. And a lot of our traumas are from abandonment and that sense of that we don't matter or that we're not worth what we are worth. And so there, there's a lot in this picture where you see that he's reaching for something that he can't achieve himself. And he's hoping right. that people don't forget where he's at. Yeah, and I think that, I, I feel it's very interesting the perspective he puts the viewer in, you know, where you're kind of at the bottom and everything is like arched up. Um, and as the viewer, mm -hmm. you're the closest one to the key. You realize that you're right. the closest one to the key to his freedom. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of suggestive. Yeah, I actually didn't think of that. That is, yeah, very good. Um, this is a close up. Um, and then this piece actually talks about that abandonment um, that you spoke about before. Um, yeah. And and so this is it was a three panel series, and this is two of them. And in the center of this was uh, two people in hazmat suits that were embraced in like a loving embrace. And they were just in this tumultuous explosion, like at the center of an atom bomb. And 
you see these things from a distance where these rockets are all leaving and they're trying to get away from the explosions that are happening around them, you know, that this destructive environment. And these are different perspectives of what it feels like to watch other people leave mm -hmm. and be left behind. And so as he, for him, balloons always represent this idea of being uplifted or the hope that we might have as people, as children, as adults, you know, this unconscious desire to be lifted. And as he's sitting there and he's letting the, he's trying to catch the balloon, you know, his hope is drifting away and it's fall, it's going up with the rockets and everything that, that is in that, the people that are leaving. And then if you see the other panel where they, there's this blue light, there's this cold, numb feeling that's hitting into all of this warmth and, and, and well-being, so to speak, you know, this life that's, that's all of the light that's warm is leaving. Mm. And that cold light has a little devil above it and it's pointing at him and it, that ice and that coldness is landing on him where he feels isolated again. And he feels like that person before all of this journey began. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a cold, lonely place. And then if you notice the light next to him on the other side isn't on at all. So there's no other light. It feels like things are leaving and that they might not come back. So there's no vehicle for him to follow and to be in that space. But it's really that, that really isolated feeling of not. And he and I painted this one together as I was going home. So I know personally that that is exactly the narrative that he was trying to share in that space. That was him coping with that pain. Mm. Yeah, I feel like it's such a powerful image. It's such a powerful image, a, a way to, a way to, you know, a, a metaphor for what that felt like. You know, that he's on this planet, you know, far away from Earth, and everyone that he knows is is leaving in a rocket ship, and he's kind of stuck there in this chaotic, surreal world that's so disconnected. Um, yeah. And I, I, as I get to know Kenneth's work more i feel that he's such a master of light um and the way he he describes like the way he um you know the, the light that's happening in the cloud and then how he's using that um for the like, reflective moment on the right painting to um to paint the light coming through the the holes there and that blue light that you said he's like really contrasting that cold light and the warm one of the the fire um, and then the last painting that I thought you could speak about is this one. Um, and, and so a lot of this was, is a content, is, is a kind of, it's a metaphorical freedom and it's, it's meant to lead to a true, you know, physical freedom. And mm -hmm. so this initial part that you see is where his mask is, is, is taken off, you know, and, and this, and if you notice, it's also done in blackface. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this was also the way he felt that he was born into a societal standard or that, and one that he adopted as a kid, you know, not, not that it was even pressed on him, but that he adopted this idea and that this was destructive to him and that for him to look beyond that and to find the beauty in his world and the roses around him and to place it at rest, to acknowledge it, to, to give it its it's due to acknowledge it and then move on was something that liberated him from prison, that liberated him from the environment that he was trapped in. And in the picture, you see the handcuffs are off. He's, he's standing in a field in the shorts because right. all of his garments are been dispersed and he's no longer trapped inside of that label. Yeah. And there's two labels there. There's the label of the blackface coming up, you know, the gang, the whole idea of his own culture, like the way he was brought up in as an identity setting that aside and finding out who he was. But there's also this idea of putting to rest the identity as a prisoner, as somebody that is trapped inside of this condemnation or that there is nothing, that they are their commitment offense. Mm -hmm. So when he transcended that mask, he also transcended his commitment offense and became who he was today. And, and that ahead of him in that journey is an open field of light and well-being and that there is actual spiritual, emotional, and physical freedom in that. Right, beautiful. And again, with the light here, like, you know, him creating this early morning light as compared to here, mm. like, he just is such a master of, of mood. Yeah. Um, and I love this one because as you pointed out, you see the shackles there in the field 
and the pants and like you kind of slowly discover that as you as you get more involved in, in, the, in the painting. Um, so that's, um, um, that's it for the presentation. Why do you think making art while you're incarcerated, why was it so important? Well, I, I think that a lot of times what real art does is it gives somebody a voice. And I know that we use that term a lot and it almost gets, you know, like we become numb to what it really means. And I think in there, it means something even more because uh, people that are incarcerated, the last thing somebody is ever gonna ask somebody inside is, how do you feel and what do you think? So as you sit in that space, and you're asked to express yourself, that implies somebody is listening, you know, and, and to define your experience outside of a survival mode, you know, as to, to look at yourself as a human being right. is, is something that just doesn't happen inside of our prison system. So, so anytime you really get into a real art space, once you get past the skill set, and you look at it as a force of expression or this idea that it is interconnecting you with another human being that may or may not understand what you're going through. It's very important to know that that is probably the solely the most important thing for somebody that's incarcerated. It, the whole environment is designed to disconnect you not only from your family, mm -hmm. from your community, but even from your own humanity. You know, so to be asked those questions and to be given venues where you actually have worth or value, I don't think that there's anything more valuable in that you could give somebody inside the prison. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Um, so that, um, I was gonna open up for uh, questions if anyone had any questions. Um, and it's a, it's a small group, so I thought, if, you know, we could just have more of a general conversation if anyone um, had any thoughts about, um, you know, make, making art while incarcerated or um, they had any thoughts about the specific paintings? I had a question. Yeah. Um, so the other day you talked about, Chris, you talked about painting things with web, especially in this other um, sequence that is not here. <clears throat> so I was wondering how do prisoners paint with each other? How do you integrate other perspectives and I mean, what are the logistics of that one? And then two, what is the emotional experience of that? Um, you mean the logistics of the art room or? or No, actually painting with someone else. Well, it's, it's kind of a slow process because it's just like if you were an artist in, a, in the free world, usually you go to school and you learn how to learn perspective. You might learn color theory. You might learn, you know, different other artists style. You learn the history of art and like what different styles were trying to express and where there was coming from. So there's kind of like this, this, you know, uh, you know, this, this field you hit where you, you kind of have to get the logistics to have enough skills to, to then start delving into, okay, what am I going to express? So that you're not stuck in the logistics of it. It kind of slows your roll down. Yeah. But a lot of the times it's, it's really just an environment that asks you that question, you know, that sits down there. Most of us was like each one teach one. So like Webb was my direct student. So me and he and I would sit there and hash something out. So we would do the sketches. We would, and, and so he's learning the process that I learned and I'm teaching it to him directly and kind of like walking him through it until he starts getting his own process together. But a lot of it, I'll, I'll give you an example to where it really became proprietary is when we had, at some point we had ended up, uh, Annie Buckley had started coming through. She came through with a tour and I talked to her and I was like, look, what we need here is college level education for the guys in here because we're all self-taught and we, we've learned a great deal through courses and other little things that we've been able to find. But what we really need is critiques and, and people to come in and, and share how to expand our awareness and what's going on so that we can elevate ourselves and be better artists. And I think that as soon as there was people coming in every week just to look at the art we were doing during the week, it absolutely revolutionized the way the intensity of the art room and what they were trying to say because they knew someone was listening. 
Mm-hmm. So, so for me, that the most crucial part of art is that somebody is listening. You can become a technically skilled, amazing portrait artist, but it doesn't mean anything if the person doesn't recognize, you know, doesn't have a connection to what you're doing. And when they, and they, I noticed they lean to what people value. So if somebody came in and was like, I'm more interested in how you feel, then they're going to do art that expresses that idea. If you're a technical artist and they just want to see how good you can draw an eye, does it look 3D and the color is amazing and then that's what you're going to lend towards. So when people came in that were more sincere artists or people that kind of came from the art field and asked, who are you? What are you trying to say? And is it being conveyed? That was a much different conversation for people. Does anyone else have any other questions? Um, I'm one more, if I can. Yeah. Which yeah. is, um, how is it for you? And also the fact that you've been talking to Webb. Um, how was it for you and everyone not being able to see the display and the impact that your art is having on on, uh, on people outside when you were inside? And then how? Um, like, what is that experience? And then what's Webb's experience been given that he's in the show and we're seeing it in person and, and virtually, but he can't watch that or see that? Well, well, those are two, you know, big points right there is that mm-hmm. when from the art room's perspective, like we would spend obviously months, sometimes years producing art that was suitable for a certain venue or, or a place once we started getting into, you know, sharing it as a voice for our community, because in a lot of ways we felt that we were speaking for the whole yard or the prison system because most people didn't have this outlet or capacity to to share in this way with other people. So it we would put a lot of time and effort into that voice. And from an experience on the inside, once we handed off that art and gave it to somebody else, we we never saw it again. I mean, I've done thousands of paintings over the last decade inside. I have no idea where they're at, what they're doing, what's going on. I, I don't even have pictures of them because we aren't allowed to have pictures of our art, you know, or, you know, we don't, we can't take them on the inside, I should say. So, you know, the few pictures that filtered back to us, or if we were lucky, I mean, even if I like say we did a, uh, an event with Mitra, well, she, they might allow her to come in to ask us to do the paintings, but we might never see her again because she's not allowed back into the prison. Yeah. So, the, the connection with the end result was very disconnected, you know, so it was just this idea that we were giving to something that we cared deeply about. And so as, as I stand out here free now, and I look back at it and I go, this is something that is uh, something I want him to experience the way. And for me coming through, I saw it for the, you know, the first few times out here going, this is what it felt like to be on the other side of our exhibit. And I thought, what a crime that, that they don't get to understand how impactful what they're doing is or what, how much meaning it gives to the people that come through these events. And that the, that the way the system is designed is that you never get to receive that interaction. Right. So we work really hard. And obviously, Webb is somebody that I, I love deeply and, and is a... Uh, you know, he's family to me. I mean, we grew up together in there. He's, you know, he's, he's somebody that I, I care so much about. So as, as I see his work out here speaking, I, I try to intimate it to him, send him the pictures, share with him how people do care about what is being said, not only with his art, but as, as a whole, you know, the people that if they take the time to speak, they are heard and it is impactful. It's, it's definitely something that we care deeply about. Yeah, I think that communicating, like I'm trying as hard as I can to like send photos and send like documentation and eat like even like steps along the way of like the install, uh, installing it and and um, people's feedback. But but it's definitely hard because you can't you can't replicate that experience of, you know. Well, I, I think just your your mindfulness of it and intention really changes it a lot. You know, like I said, most most of the time before now, uh, you know, the, the, you're, you're donating it to an agency that's looking for the money. They're not even really that worried about your boy most of the time. So like as where you are actually concerned about the voice of the person that's involved and, and are mindful of, of that, I, I've seen you be very considerate of his needs. And obviously I'm very grateful for that as well. Well, thank I, you so much. I have a oh. question for 
Christian. Yeah. So, uh, Christian, that sounds like a, a wonderful opportunity that you created, you, all of you created for yourselves, that art room on the A yard. Um, I've seen guys, though, when they come out, especially after they've been inside for a long time, you've got this whole universe of new things to deal with and learn and just getting your life in order and stuff like that. And I, I, it can be hard to keep creating, I know, uh, when you're out. Have, have you, what have been your experiences around continuing to create now that you've been out? Right. Well, I've, I think since I've been out, I've only painted four paintings. And I've, I think five pieces of art altogether. And I've done a few sketches and, and kind of like tried to find some of the paintings that I sent out. You know, I've, I've had like a vague attachment to it. Uh, I've pushed a lot of Webb's art out into the world because I feel like he doesn't have a voice. So I've spent more of my energy trying to filter it back to the guys inside that I feel like I have a voice now. I have the ability to speak for myself and and to present myself. And the work that I do in restorative justice is this huge amplified voice where I can share my experience and pull people into to what it is that transformation is, where it comes from, and, and kind of be in that space with them. And to me, that's what art was for me inside. So, uh, and, and for them, it's so important for them to receive that opportunity that I, it almost feels wrong for me to lend into it that way out here, but just recently I've started having that desire to, to slow down and go, you know, I, I'm starting to, to feel that urge to, to get my hands on new materials and, and try to, to give some type of expression that is a feeling versus a, a cerebral expression, you know, and really, so it never really leaves you. And, and I know that it's something that is proprietary to the change that I experienced inside. And that is something that is always going to be a force within me is that desire to create and to have my hands on something and for somebody else to experience what I've experienced and as a, as a byproduct to inspire other people to ask themselves that question and know that what they have in their hands can be a force of expression. And I, I think that that's something that never, you know, at least from the experience I had in there will ever leave me. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point you bring up, Peter, because I, I, I feel that maintaining a studio practice on top of all the pressures that are, you know, very immediate after you, you get out of prison, it's pretty impressive um, because you've got like parole. And I know a lot of the artists that um, like Gary, who's in the show, um, it's he's he's in a housing development that he doesn't want to be in like he has a, he wants to go back home to his wife but like parole requires him for some reason to stay in this facility for six months and he he wants so badly to create and he's got all of his supplies but he literally doesn't have space you know because he's like in like a bunk bed with this other person and it's like very chaotic and um and so like having once he gets settled he'll like have that space but you really have to it's very I feel from what I what I've heard from other artists that it's, it's a very active effort like you really have to you know <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah. When, whenever you're in shared housing it's yeah. almost worse than prison because it's right. it, it isn't structured and you're usually crammed in a room with four guys that's meant for one person to to live in and and mm -hmm. uh you're under rules at a halfway house or at a mm -hmm. you know a re-entry home where you have a lot of classes you have to attend you have to do a lot of uh you know extra you know getting your identification going out get your social security driver's license like all of these logistics really drain you emotionally mm -hmm. mentally uh, and a lot of times, even though they say they're helping you through that process, it's just not really, you're, you're finding your own way in that. And so you're kind of stumbling along and you're just working with your determination for the most part. Uh, and we help each other as much as we can find with, you know, the kind of like we do on the inside. Yeah. But art, art is, I, I think that it's, there's a, I guess there's a boundary in my mind between what is monetarily good and what is actually life-saving while you're as a coping mechanism in prison. And to me, I see art as a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's something that, I, that, that gives you something in a way that you cannot, as I've explained, find in prison. So in there, it's really a lifeline. 
It's an opportunity to find your own humanity. It's a place where you can have a private space, at least in your mind and in your heart. And it's a place for you to share that once you define it with somebody else. And so out here, you get to do that as a human being. You just get the right to do that. So it, it, it doesn't have the same weight out here as it would inside because you're allowed to, to care about people and to be heard and to do those things. And a lot of the times you would rather just be helpful to somebody or sit in space and you know, listen to their story or you know, do the things you could never do before. Wow, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think about that distinction, but I'm really happy you brought it up because I think it, it makes, I mean, it makes a lot of sense and allows me to kind of understand that perspective of what it's like to leave and and how art, how the meaning of art changes from that space to the, you know, the everyday. Because I know for me, a lot of the times, the only reason why I've done four paintings is because the people that I did it for, I was emotionally connected to. Mm -hmm. So. It was always about emotional connection for me. It was always about that. It wasn't about money. Obviously, I was giving it away to charities, right? It was about having a connection and being interconnected. So, so the only art I've done out here is when I've expressed extreme gratitude for the people that have been influential in my life. So it, it just, it, it really is a different, art is a different thing when you're incarcerated. It means something different to the artist. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I, I wanted to wrap this up around 45 minutes. Um, but um, thank you, everyone who's joining and Christian for sharing so much of your knowledge um, and your time. Yeah, my um, pleasure. My pleasure as always. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, there'll be a recording of this and I'll, um, I'm going to post it. Um, I'll send it via email, but then I'll, I'll post it on Instagram. So if you want to look back at it, you'll have it. Um, okay. Well, hope you guys have the good holidays and thank you so much. Nice yeah, conversation. Thanks, guys. Good Thanks seeing you again. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.